I'm so glad to be back in Washington because if you're a historian coming to Washington, it's like a dream come true. Not only is it a dream for going to the Library of Congress and working with documents, but it's a dream with the warm welcome you get when you come back, when you come out of the caves of research and your book is actually on the shelves. Um, so it's fantastic to be here. Um, four years ago, I realized the Apollo 11 anniversary was coming up, and I grew up in Houston around the corner from the astronauts, and I was a Eagle Scout at the National Jamboree in Idaho when Neil Armstrong said hello to all of us on the way to the moon. And I thought, I really want to read the book on Apollo 11, you know, the sort of big history book that tells you everything about it, that explains the science, that takes you behind the scenes, that shows what happened, that explains what happened afterward. And I went out, and although there are an incredible number of wonderful books and fantastic archives and really great magazine articles and things like that, no one had really pulled all of this material together into one coherent book, and I decided that's what I would do. And about um, uh, a couple of years into doing this, I went to Kennedy Space Center to see a shuttle launch from the same launch pad that Apollo 11 used. And any of you who haven't been, run. You have got to see a launch at Kennedy. It is one of the most incredible things you will ever experience in your life. You get to see waves of vibration hitting the ground coming towards you. You spend 10 seconds looking at the cloud appearing around the rocket, thinking something terrible has happened because you can't hear anything. And then all of a sudden, this roar greets your ears because you're three miles away. So there's a difference between what you see and what you hear. It's an unbelievable experience. But anyway, while I was there, I was having a pretty rough time, both with this book and in my personal life. And, and I was sort of wandering around Kennedy, and I saw this strange little place here at Kennedy. And I asked, said, well, what is that? And they said, that's Launch Complex 34. And I said, well, what's Launch Complex 34? They said, well, that's where the Apollo 1 fire happened, where three astronauts lost their lives. And we've left sort of the ruins of this as a memorial to them. And when you go up closer to this, you can see that uh, they have a plaque. And on this plaque is a little Latin phrase that says, ad astra per aspera, which they've translated as, a rough path leads to the stars. And I was sort of dumbstruck by seeing this phrase, because it was sort of everything that was going on with this book and everything that was going on in my life at that moment, and I just couldn't believe it because the thing that really shocked me in researching this book was how tremendously difficult the space race was, especially how dangerous, how unbelievably dangerous it was. And so to illustrate that, I'd like to talk to you about um, at, least the, the at least three times we know of that one guy, while he was working for NASA, almost got killed, and his name's Neil Armstrong. The first time Mr. Armstrong almost died, was uh, when he was working for NASA when it was still called the NACA. And he was out in the Antelope Valley of California. And you've heard all about this. This is where Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier. And what Mr. Armstrong was doing was flying an incredible plane called the X-15. But at, he was also working with a lot of other people. In this moment, he is co-piloting that B-29 up there. And they are ferrying another pilot in that sky rocket down below. In this picture, the sky rocket has already been released. But anyway, at the time I'm talking about, the sky rocket is still attached to that B-29. And uh, all, Armstrong and his co-pilot noticed that one of the propellers is going wonky. Now, for those of you who don't fly, it's very upsetting to a pilot when a propeller starts going wonky because if the propeller comes loose, it turns into a flying chainsaw. So the pilots told the guy in the sky rocket that he had to be jettisoned. And the guy said, you can't jettison me. I'm having valve problems. And they said, we're really sorry. You're going now. And they jettisoned him. And right after they did, that propeller came loose and turned into this flying chainsaw. And first it sliced right through the bay where that skyrocket was sitting. And then it sliced right through two of the other four engines. So the skyrocket had to come down with valve problems. This giant B-29 had to land on one engine. And everybody made it home OK. The second time Armstrong very nearly died while working at NASA, was on his catastrophic Gemini 8 mission, where because of the way they decided to go to the moon, uh, astronauts had to learn how to rendezvous and dock in outer space. And during Gemini, they tried learning how to dock and rendezvous many, many times, and many times they failed. This was the first successful time that they docked, which was Gemini 8, 
And almost immediately after docking, these two craft began spinning and spinning and spinning. So they undocked, thinking that would solve the problem, but it didn't. It got worse. And the little Gemini on the left started spinning at one revolution per second, which meant that if it got worse, the two pilots, uh, Mr. Scott and Mr. Armstrong, could be rendered unconscious and the ship could be spun out of control. And finally, they had to abort the mission and use all of their power to come on home. And it turned out that there had been like a little short and one of the thrusters had gotten stuck and it was firing over and over and over again and causing their sh ship to spin out of control. It just took that little thing to almost destroy the crew. And the third time Mr. Armstrong was almost killed, he was actually training for Apollo 11 in something called the LLRV. And this was, a, as you can see, a giant iron bedstead. And you sat on top of it, and then you had a rocket motor underneath it, and you would practice landing on the moon. And in this case, uh, Mr. Armstrong's 21st attempt at flying this thing, uh, wind shear caught it at 100 feet of altitude, and it started crashing towards the ground, and he ejected out of it, and the thing exploded in a fireball, and he got out with two-fifths of a second to spare. And he took off his uniform, and went back to his office. And a number of astronauts had heard that someone had almost died practicing this, but they couldn't figure out who it was because Neil Armstrong was just sitting in his office. And a couple of days later, they asked him, well, what was it like when you almost died that time? And he said, well, you know, it's always a sad day when you lose a machine. <laughs> so that shows you the incredible difficulties that they had in undergoing this to me. And, uh, uh, and besides the fact that how incredibly dangerous the space race was, the other thing that was incredible about it was the technology. And here is Werner von Braun posing before, I think you can see, four of the five engines of his masterpiece, the Saturn V. And these engines, even though we had the finest rocket team in the world, it took them seven years to make these engines because the engines kept blowing up. And in fact, you actually want engines to blow up because basically when you fly a rocket, you're flying enormous bombs with explosions pointed in one direction. Only these explosions were not pointing in one direction. They were blowing up in all different directions. And so that's why it took seven years to make these engines. And the other incredible thing about these engines is that if you look at a lot of the history of rocketry, you see the rockets crash into their launch towers a lot, which is a problem. You don't want to crash into your launch tower when you're trying to go in outer space. These rockets have gimbals. They can slightly tilt. These enormous motors have gimbals that slightly tilt so that you can slightly tilt your rocket away from your launch pad and avoid hitting the side of your controller. And the, the other thing about them is so incredible is that the Von Braun team engineered these giant hold-down arms, which would keep the rocket from only rising a little bit until all of these enormous motors had achieved full power. And then it would release the rocket, and it would rise into the air in a stable flying fashion, which is something you're looking for when you're buying rockets. So really, he created this staggering masterpiece. And one of the most beautiful things to me is going to Kennedy and seeing the whole way that it works. NASA actually manufactures very little of what we see when they take off. They hire subcontractors. And if you add up everybody who worked for the subcontracts and worked for NASA that made uh, men go to the moon, it took 400,000 Americans to do this. And in fact, I dedicated my book to them because my favorite part of doing this book of course, I like hearing about the astronauts and the famous ground mission control people we all know about. But my favorite part was hearing about people we never heard about, which is those 400,000 people. And they're everybody from women who are weaving memory cores for the computers to plumbers and things like that. It's an incredible thing. But here you can see the vehicle assembly building on the left, which is the famous 500-foot high building where if they don't leave the air conditioning on, clouds will form inside and it will rain. Uh, where they assemble these fantastic rockets. And then uh, you see that is actually the Apollo 11 rocket with its uh, lobster red tower. And it's on something the size of a baseball diamond, which is basically a giant tank cleats. And they're taking it one, uh, a little bit over a mile there out to right by the Atlantic Ocean where the launch pad is. And it will take them seven hours to get from the building on the left to that launch pad by the ocean.